Thank you. Uh, my name is Tim DeChristopher. I'm a resident of Pawtucket, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify tonight. Before I moved to Rhode Island, I was incarcerated for two years um, as a political prisoner in the federal prison system uh, from 2011 to 2013. Uh, the two years after that, I spent as a student at Harvard Divinity School. Um, and in that two years that I was locked up, I spent one period of time in segregated isolation, segregated confinement, a uh, period of 22 days. And um, I'm more than willing to talk about the, the absurdities that put me into the, the segregation in the first place, but I understand that the Federal Bureau of Prisons is a very different bureaucracy than, than what this legislation deals with. So I want to um, confine my comments to, to what I see as the fundamental nature of, of segregated isolation um, that I think is very true across different systems. Um, as it's been said many times tonight, segregated isolation does psychological harm to, to the people that are segregated. And, and I want to try to identify how that harm happens and exactly what that is um, as, I, as I experienced from my own perspective. Uh, a lot of the people that I talked to that, that went into segregation, both before and after my own period in there, they, a lot of them talked about losing their mind. And even some of the most strong and stable people that I knew um, that, that you could count on in a lot of different ways, they, they flat out said when they were in segregation, they lost their minds. And, and that's really the soundtrack of segregation, of the segregation unit, is you can hear people losing their minds all the time. You can hear it through the walls, through the doors, through the vents. My second day in isolation, the person in the cell next to me, right on the other side of the wall, lost his mind. And for several hours, he was screaming, he was banging his head against the door, banging against the wall, repeating the same thing over and over. It's, it's incredibly disturbing to, to hear that sound of someone just losing their mind. And, and myself, I was in a very stressful position. Um, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know how long I was going to be in there. Um, and, and so I had so much stress myself that I couldn't, I couldn't handle his stress at the same time. And so I blocked it off. And, and the more I began to hear people losing their minds throughout that wing, the more, the more practiced I got at just blocking those people off. And, and what started as just telling myself that, that his issues right now are not, are not my issues. Whatever he's feeling, I, I can't allow myself to feel that right now. It then became that noise is not, is not my problem. And then I just stopped hearing the noise. And, and so I think what I was doing as a coping mechanism to deal with that environment was to shut down my own empathy. I taught myself to just not see the humanity of the people around me. And I think that's the fundamental nature of segregation, is that it's a, it's a system in which the only way to cope with it is to shut down your empathy. And I was thankfully only in there for 22 days. And the reason I was, only in the, I was released after 22 days is that I was part of an activist community who was able to leverage a lot of pressure and a lot of media pressure from the outside to barrage the Bureau of Prisons with phone calls and force them to let me go after 22 days. And, and I can see that easy, even as someone that I consider to be a stable person, um, I can see that that was having an impact on me. And I don't know how much longer it would have been of shutting down my empathy until that became permanent damage, permanent damage to my empathy. And, and as I'm sure you know, a lack of empathy is at the root of a lot of our antisocial behavior and psychological disorders, the most serious psychological disorders, are strongly associated with a lack of empathy. And that's what the institution of segregation does to people. It's like a training system that trains them to not see the humanity of others. And I understand that, that there are really difficult and unstable people in prison. Trust me, after two years, I, I understand that that's a serious thing. But this system of segregation reinforces and in a lot of cases creates that problem. And so, yes, we need to deal with that safety issue in these institutions. But the first step to dealing with a complex problem like that is to stop making the problem worse. Stop causing that damage that is creating these difficult situations. And then the second step, of course, is to start learning from 
all the other developed countries on this planet, which are all able to deal with these issues without the, the rampant use of segregated confinement. Every single other developed country in the world is able to deal with this. And I think that we should be able to deal with this in our country as well. And that's why I'm asking you to, to support this bill. Um, because it's so serious, I want to share a few specific concerns that I have with the language of the bill that I think could make it more effective. Um, I, and I, I understand your concerns about whether or not a piece of legislation can actually address this complex of an issue. Um, and, and I think you have to try. That, that is your job. Um, and, and where I see some concerns is with some vague pieces of language in there. Um, specifically, it, in, there's one line that says that an inmate in segregation should not be put on a restricted diet. In my 22 days in, in segregation, I lost 12 pounds. I, I ate every bit of food that they passed through the door. I ordered everything on commissary that I was allowed to order, and I ate all of that, and I wasn't exercising while I was in there, and yet I lost 12 pounds. But yet the prison officials that were in charge of me would have said that I wasn't on a restricted diet. They would have said that I was getting the same food as everyone else. It's just that that food was put into the tray that was designed for the segregation prisoners with little compartments that were like this big. And, and so I was getting tiny quantities of food. So if the intent of that line is that inmates in segregation get the same quantity and quality of food as, as other inmates, I'd encourage you to spell that out and say that they get the same quantity and quality. Or if the intention is that they get a minimum amount of calories or that certain nutritional standards, I'd encourage you to spell that out. De detail helps in, with these sorts of things. The other area where I see that kind of vagueness is in the language that talks about an hour of recreation a day. And it says inmates are allowed to have an hour of, of recreation every day. The system that I was in also said that we were allowed to have an hour of, of recreation a day. And yet weeks went by where I didn't get that, and most of the other people that I saw didn't get that. And, and part of the reason for that is that giving an inmate in segregation recreation time is kind of a hassle for the, for the correction officers. The way that that operates is that for each cell, they have to, the inmate has to back up to the door, put their hands through the slot, get handcuffed, then step away from the door. The door gets opened. They get patted down. The, in, the guard has to walk them downstairs or out to the, the yard. Then all that happens in reverse with the, with the little cage outside. You put your hands through the slot. They unlock it. Then you can have your recreation. Then they got to do all that to get you back up into the cell. And, and so depending on who was on shift with the corrections officers that week, there wouldn't be an opportunity to say that you wanted to be, you wanted to get recreation. Because in order to get it, you had to get your name on the list. You had to say that you wanted recreation. And so certain corrections officers, they would walk by at 6 a.m. They would walk down the hall, and it was the only time that I would see them hold their keys and make no noise when they walked down the hall. And we weren't allowed to have watches in there, and this was before they turned on the lights. So... If you were ready, if you could wake yourself up on your own at 5.55 in the morning and be down at the little window to your door and say, I want to go to recreation, you could get your hour of recreation. If you weren't, you didn't get your recreation because you didn't say that you wanted it. So I would, I would encourage you to, to make that language as strong as possible. You know, there's a big difference between a piece of legislation that says inmates are allowed an hour of recreation a day versus a piece of legislation that says inmates shall get an hour of recreation a day unless they refuse. Because then that flips the responsibility there. It flips the expectation that they're going to get it unless they refuse. And then when anybody investigates that system, they could say, show me the evidence of how this inmate refused their rec recreation on all of these days. So I'd encourage you to make that, that language as strong as possible. From, from my experience in that system, um, I agree with the UN tri tribunal that defined segregation as torture. But I can also say from my experience that the people who carry out that torture, the guards who carry out that torture, by and large don't do so because they're some kind of sociopaths. They do it because it's easier than the alternative. And so if you want to change that status quo, I think you need to be 
very clear about how you want that to change. And some of the pieces, some of the language in the legislation that I see that is strong and that is clear are things like where it says time out of cell, like that phrase out of cell. You know, it, it might be kind of awkward. It might not even be linguistically correct, but it's clear. You're either in the cell or you're out. It's black and white. And and that's the kind of language that I think needs to be preserved in this bill um, and, and strengthened across the board. And as this bill evolves, you know, when, when people try to change that very clear language about out of cell, you'll know that they're trying to weaken or kill the spirit of this bill. And we will know it as well. And we will remember, you know, just because solitary confinement and segregated isolation is commonplace right now in this country does not mean that it will always be considered morally acceptable. There are certainly a lot of chapters in the history of this country and the history of this plantation in which we can look back on behavior that was commonplace that we now consider to be morally reprehensible. And I'm confident that as our society evolves and keeps working towards our shared values, that we will look back on segregated confinement in the same way that we look back on some of those morally reprehensible behaviors that we've largely left in the past. And so I'm asking you to be on that right side of history. Thank you.